We're live. <laughs> we're live. Excellent. Hi. Uh, we're actually going to go um, ahead with the presentation and so on in a few minutes. We'll just allow a few minutes uh, longer for anyone who's logging in at exactly 7 o'clock um, so we don't leave them behind. Uh, but we'll start, uh, start in a few minutes. And but in the meantime, we'll... Uh, we'll, we'll, in the meantime, we'll do yep. the, uh, the, the Ray, ch chit chat. Ray and I will be uh, uh, Richard and Judy. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure who's going to be Judy. Yeah. <laughs> Except that we don't have any guests. Uh, oh, we've got come somebody else just come in. Yeah, here we are. We've got some Joe. So, hello, Joe. Right. It's all very strange because I have to stare at a camera that's nowhere near a screen, so I can't actually see what's going on. What's going out unless I look away, in which case I look down and then here, yeah. broadcast the side of my head. Um, yeah, and Jean, Jean can hear, and uh, <coughs> Joe. Oh, that's Graham Williamson, who's uh, a yeah. colleague of mine from. Uh, well, you know, you met him. You know, you know Graham. He, he was oh, yes. co-organising yes. in the first place. Yep. Uh, so there's just actually me on camera, Ray's diligently working in the background, and Joe can hear uh, everything, so. doing uh, doing all the hard work, typing away, making sure it all works okay. Um, or I just get to sit here and chat. We'll give it another minute or so, and uh, and then we'll crack on. I think. Do you, want to, do you want to say anything about what you do, Ray? Um, okay, I can if you want. Yeah, I'll, uh, while while we're waiting, I'll tell you. I'll put on the other camera a minute. <coughs> Zoom. So, hello. Um, well, Cito and Graham know me, and uh, Jason knows me. Uh, but uh, hello. Miranda, Jean, and uh, and Joe, I'm I'm Ray Jones, and uh, um, with Cito Maramba, who's there in the chat room, we've uh, we've set this uh, facility up. We use it for our students, and um, we use it for open webinars. Uh, you'll see when you when you came in and logged in, you'll see there's some various uh, seminars coming up that you're welcome to join or um, recommend to any of your friends, colleagues, or, or patients or anybody. Um, so we use it both. Uh, some for these external events and also for internal events. Um, one of the things that you'll find is that if you, if by chance the picture does freeze or something, you'll see um, just above the my head there, above Tony's head when it hits back on him, it says if you uh, press F5 to restore it again. So if if for some reason the video and the sound freezes, you can do that. If you want to have a private chat with somebody uh, there, you can click on their name on the uh, the participant list which is over there on that side of the screen um, and I, as far as I can understand you're all watching in the broadband version which is that you see you're seeing uh, and hearing this otherwise you wouldn't be able to see what I'm pointing at um, if, if for some reason you were doing this in, in an NHS environment and the bandwidth seemed to be too low sometimes hospitals don't give you enough bandwidth not as much as you do at home um, you can get the lower bandwidth version that CETO has developed uh, just yesterday, uh, which just allows you to see the slides and the and hear the sound. Uh, and uh, Graham's, as you see, we, we can have avatars if you're logged in for the regulars. So Graham, C CETO, and myself have got pictures there on the on the chat over there. Um, but as your guests, you you all look like um, IRA suspects. So sorry about that. Uh, I think I'll turn myself off now and <laughs> hand back to uh, Tony. I'm on? Yep, you're on. Okay, so, well, crackhead, I'm uh, Tony Todd, one of the new haematologists in the uh, North Devon, uh, Royal Devon and Exeter Haematology Network. We uh, 
we haven't come up with a nice mnemonic for that uh, yet, so it's a little bit of a mouthful. Uh, Jason Capel was going to be joining me uh, today, but unfortunately unforeseen circumstances have meant that he can't get down here, but uh, he's logged onto the webcast uh, and is, uh, is watching in cyberspace. Uh, what, uh, what I'll do is go very briefly, and it'll just be a short presentation, running through how the new service, the new network service looks, um, how many consultants there are, roughly the size of the service and the area that we cover, um, just to give you a feel for who we are and, and what we can offer. And then I'll do uh, some interesting referrals uh, that Jason and I have picked up recently. I think we advertised uh, my last five referrals um, but in fact, uh, we'll, we'll just do two or three because uh, we do get some quite interesting cases and there's a lot of meat to some of these. Um, we are interested perhaps in doing this kind of thing uh, as a more frequent uh, educational session if there's some positive feedback from this uh, where we could do uh, webcasts looking at uh, a selection of interesting referrals from the preceding uh, month or couple of months depending on how frequently we do this. Um, so if that would be of educational interest, do let us uh, know. But anyway, just uh, for now we'll, we'll talk about uh, the network service, then as I say we'll do uh, a few referrals and then uh, a chance for some interaction, questions, answers and so on at the end of that. So the PowerPoint slide itself probably lasts not longer than, than about 10 minutes uh, and then we'll have plenty of time um, to, uh, to take a, a kind of free-for-all after that. Uh, and of course this will be archived uh, so anybody who's not watching this live, hello uh, and uh, well done for finding it uh, in the archive. So, uh, we're based, uh, probably as most of you know, at uh, North Devon uh, District Hospital in Barnstable and of course the Royal Devon in Exeter uh, in Exeter. We do clinics there but we also have some satellite clinics. Uh, South Moulton, there's a clinic once a month uh, and we've done some clinics in uh, Biddeford the Biddeford clinics uh, haven't happened recently um, because of uh, service pressures, but we have a new consultant coming uh, at the end of this month and uh, we'll look again, I think, uh, uh, at the feasibility of those uh, clinics. That roughly uh, is the area that uh, we draw referrals from. Please don't take that as geographical uh, gospel, um, but uh, that's broadly speaking uh, where we uh, where we source our, our patients from and, and where most of the GPs we interact with are. So we cover about 560,000 uh, patients. We offer what's called a level three service and that means uh, that we offer of course uh, all the outpatient services but intensive chemotherapy for acute leukemia is all treated within our network uh, and we provide autologous, uh, so same uh, person stem cell transplant for um, somewhere between 10 and 20 patients a year. That's done uh, at the Exeter site uh, where we have 13 beds, 10 of which are individual rooms uh, with uh, highly efficient, particularly screened air uh, and uh, positive uh, uh, pressure, uh, sorry, uh, negative pressure. So we do roughly 11 clinics a week at the RD&E site uh, and five clinics a week at uh, North Devon, although that will increase soon uh, to be quite uh, one clinic a month as head of Stratton and in all we see somewhere between 11 and 12,000 patients uh, per year uh, across the whole network. Um, now uh, the seven and a half uh, consultants, uh, the well currently the six and a half but the extra body will be joining us in a couple of weeks. Over the two sites we have two uh, clinical nurse specialists, one specialist registrar, a couple of uh, staff grades, one at each site, clinical assistant, uh, two clinical assistants, sorry, a clinical fellow and a couple of uh, F2s uh, at, uh, and those numbers should increase slightly, we're going to get an extra clinical nurse specialist at the North Devon site hopefully uh, and those nurses will be looking, uh, or at least one of them, to run some nurse-led clinics. We're going to start up, as I'll mention in a moment, long-term lymphoma uh, clinic. Uh, we're hoping to get an additional specialist registrar to cover the network uh, and uh, we have uh, an additional F2 from time to time uh, in the service. Now, uh, actually before I go on to this slide about our interests, I, I just say I've 
talked uh, about the network service um, and we do I think now see it very much as a network rather than a service that's based on a single site with some presence at the other site. Um, now there are more consultants uh, and we're hoping as I say for a bit more expansion we're trying to view this very much as a single service which happens to occupy two sites um, and we're trying to make it as seamless as possible uh, for uh, patient transfers between those sites and for uh, bringing protocols from one site to the other so that you know wherever you enter the service be it at the North Devon site or the extra site uh, you have the same consultants the same approach uh, and access ultimately to the same facilities and the same level of care now uh, going back to this slide uh, those are the seven uh, full-time consultants and the two triangles there, malignancy and coagulation, very broadly uh, represent uh, the proportion of different interests amongst those consultants. Uh, so as you can see there, as the interest in malignancy rises, the interest in coagulation uh, wanes. Uh, I'm uh, very much at the left-hand side of that spectrum. I have a particular interest in chronic lymphocytic uh, leukemia, although I have some interest in, in coagulation. Um, Jason. Uh, has an interest in myeloproliferative disorders, um, but also uh, some interest, a considerable interest in thrombophilia. Uh, many of the other names I think probably most of you will know, Claudius Rudin's strong interest in myeloma. Paul uh, is Paul Kerr. He's the final member of our team who will be coming towards the end of this month. Uh, I've put a question mark under transplant there because uh, although Paul has a transplant background, he's uh, not uh, had a chance to meet with us all and, and hammer out his area of specialist expertise so um, he might want to develop in other areas uh, as well although we're very much hoping that, that he'll take a particular interest in transplant. Uh, Jackie Rule, another new member of the team uh, came in uh, last year her interest young adult uh, malignancy, uh, hematological malignancy and thrombophilia uh, much as with Jason and Richard Lee I'm sure almost all of you will know uh, who uh, does uh, uh, pretty much everything and, and carries a large measure of uh, the department's burden on his shoulders but has a, an interest in transfusion uh, as well as uh, doing a lot of haemophilia work. Uh, so we all see uh, a bit of everything, uh, we all see general haematology uh, but we would like over time to move towards a more specialised service and uh, certainly each of us would welcome referrals um, broadly along the lines of that little chart. Uh, and, and that is really we do see the service developing to a more uh, sub-specialized service where we can offer uh, clinics geared towards particular diseases so patients have access at, at both sites uh, to consultants who have you know the time to focus on keep up to date with the literature trials attend the meetings for uh, more specialized segments of hematology uh, and to get some more trials available for patients in diseases like uh, chrom uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, it's roughly a, th a fifth to a quarter of our workload um, in terms of malignancy and currently we have no trials running for that so we're very keen to get some of those and I'm trying to get a few set up over the next few months. Uh, Jason and Jackie are setting up a thrombophilia clinic um, which uh, I think will be a service of, of hopefully some interest um, because that thrombophilia as we'll see in the, the referral section is uh, something that uh, commonly comes up. Uh, I've uh, set up with a specialist nurse in North Devon a uh, long-term lymphoma clinic uh, for the long-term survivors we're now seeing with, with many of these lymphomas. You know, In the 1980s we didn't really have great regimens for treating them. In the 1990s much better treatments became available and now we're seeing patients who are surviving 10 or 15 years and they have all sorts of issues, early onset osteoporosis, uh, early onset cardiac disease and so on. Uh, that uh, that needs to be managed and, and indeed needs to be done in, in close liaison uh, with GPs setting up uh, with one of our pharmacists, a pharmacist led clinic at the Royal Devon and Exeter site um, and we're also having uh, Claudius uh, getting a specialist nurse uh, trained to do a, a, a similar thing for at the moment at least uh, essential thrombocythemia and some of the more stable uh, myeloproliferative disorders and we're also setting up or are trying to set up an audio-visual link, a video conferencing link between uh, the Exeter and uh, Barnstable sites so that 
uh, all the staff up there and the staff at, uh, at Exeter can attend the same educational meetings that we hold in-house uh, so that patients uh, who want to discuss with their consultant uh, an issue regarding, for example, uh, prognosis, uh, treatment and so on, uh, can do that on a day that that consultant is not necessarily in Barnstable. So I go on a Monday, but if one of my patients can only uh, be free or their family can only be free to talk to me on a Tuesday, then we can do that through the uh, video conferencing link. Uh, but the real key thing that we want to know is, is what do you guys want from us? Uh, and that's uh, something very keen to discuss uh, towards the end of this. I mean, we, we, we see this new service uh, giving uniform level of care across the two sites covering quite a large area, but while we have our idea of what we want to do with that service, I think it's extremely important that we take on board the needs and desires of uh, the GPs who are, are you know, one of our biggest user groups. Uh, so we certainly would welcome feedback uh, from you um, as to how you would like to see the surface develop. Um, so I think uh, while uh, you're digesting all of that, since we've got the PowerPoint going, um, we'll just run into the last few interesting referrals and then we can have a big discussion towards uh, the end. Uh, so just a, a few things. Um, I had a very interesting case recently. Uh, a uh, Middle Eastern lady, Egyptian lady, was referred up with uh, hypochromic microcytic anemia uh, and thrombocytopenia for further investigation. Um, now, uh, there are only really five causes of hypochromic microcytic anemia, iron deficiency, uh, heavy metal poisoning, the anemia of chronic disease, uh, sideroblastic anemia, a form of myelodysplasia, uh, and uh, hemoglobinopathies like thalassemia. Um, the thrombocytopenia, though, is uh, the interesting element to that. Myelodysplasia could certainly cause that, and it can go occasionally with sideroblastic anemia. Um, but a fact that is uh, underappreciated, perhaps, is that iron deficiency can cause thrombocytopenia also. Uh, more typically, it's associated with a normal platelet count or a platelet count that might even rise, because often iron deficiency is due to chronic hemorrhage, and that provokes uh, a mild thrombocytopenia. Mm -hmm. But when the deficiency is severe enough, uh, pancytopenia can occur. So uh, not only a fall in the hemoglobin uh, and a reduction in size and, and increase in pallor of the red cells, uh, but a fall in the platelet count, a fall in the neutrophil count, although all the elements of the white cell count can fall. Um, and indeed, this lady turned out to have a history of uh, very poor uh, diet. Unusual in the UK to see iron deficiency as a result of poor diet, but one does see it sometimes uh, in members of certain uh, cultural groups um, and also uh, menorrhagia which of course is a little difficult to quantitate although there are some tools out from the the Royal Free offering a visual scoring system uh, and she did have a ferritin which as it turned out was uh, was 12 which is quite low. Uh, she started iron and her platelet count uh, has begun to rise and her haemoglobin has uh, too. So that really just uh, to highlight that iron deficiency doesn't only cause uh, uh, anemia. Uh, this is uh, a diffuse increase in gamma globulin, it's a query that uh, we get uh, quite often. Uh, people have uh, protein electrophoresis, you know, as part of uh, a more general check, and, and sometimes that will show up a paraprotein, of course, and then we get the referrals for uh, possible myeloma, or uh, there are various lymphomas which can also be associated with a paraprotein. Uh, but a diffuse increase in gamma globulin. Uh, is also sometimes a somewhat unexpected finding um, that uh, we're often asked about. And that almost never has a hematological cause in someone who doesn't have obvious lymphadenopathy or hepatosplenomegaly. Um, the commonest causes for a diffuse increase in gamma globulin uh, are connective tissue disorders, uh, infections such as uh, HIV, uh, the uh, Chronic bronchitis can sometimes do it. Also, uh, liver disease, particularly autoimmune hepatitis, uh, cirrhosis, primary biliary cirrhosis, uh, and a scattering of, of miscellaneous causes, sarcoidosis, of course, which appears on every list of differential diagnoses. But it's occasionally seen also in, in diabetes mellitus, um, and sometimes is, is idiopathic. It often goes hand in hand with an increase in the plasma viscosity. Um, there was a study done by the Mayo uh, Clinic some years ago. They took uh, 100 or so patients uh, with this, and um, 
about 6% of them had a solid tumour. Um, almost none of them went on to develop anything hematological, and the vast majority had connective tissue disorders or, or, or liver disease. So in a patient with an unexpected diffuse increase in gamma globulins, <clears throat> it is always worth looking at, at any of those conditions. Um, and then finally, the more specific case, uh, a 45-year-old lady, as you can see on the screen there, uh, nearly two decades ago when she was pregnant in her 20s, uh, she had a DVT. She had no family history of any problems. She had had no uh, DVTs prior to that. She didn't have anything since then. Uh, she had, however, had a hysterectomy in her early 40s um, and uh, was having uh, postmenopausal symptoms very reasonably, was being considered for HRT, and her gynaecologist uh, did a thrombophilia screen because of this previous history um, of DVT, and the results got sent uh, to the uh, general practitioner, and the thrombophilia results were uh, normal slash negative, so none of the... Uh, genetic abnormalities that we screen for like factor V Leiden or the prothrombin gene mutation and normal levels of uh, things like protein C, protein S, antithrombin. Uh, but the test was done and uh, the lady's GP was uh, entirely understandably not entirely sure how to take clinical action on the basis of that. So uh, sent a referral uh, up to us. Uh, and I think that the the key thing here is that she's had a DVT and the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists recommend that HRT is avoided in patients uh, with any history of venous thromboembolic disease. Uh, that's regardless really of whether they have a thrombophilic defect or not. Uh, now that makes the thrombophilia screen to this patient at least essentially uh, irrelevant whether it shows an inherited defect or not, uh, the RCOG guidelines would be that she should not receive HRT. Um, the relevance of the screen might be, however, to her offspring. Uh, not really to any male offspring, but at the age of 45, you know, she's, she's, if the pregnancy was successful, she's got a, a child, perhaps a daughter, who's now in her uh, early 20s, uh, who may be on the pill, may be going to get pregnant, uh, and knowing that her mother has a thrombophilic defect might then make it worth testing the child, the, the daughter, uh, because the presence of a thrombophilic defect may influence the decision to start the pill or the management of pregnancy depending on the defect and depending on the, the, the history uh, of the patient who has it. So of no real relevance to the patient themselves or possible relevance, the daughter had the screen been positive. Um, the uh, patient therefore was advised to avoid uh, any hormonal therapy, to wear TEDs on long-haul flights uh, and so on. The long-haul flights is another common thing that comes up. Um, should we offer any patients anticoagulation on long-term flights? Um, the answer is probably no, um, except for patients who've had a very recent operation within the last six weeks, say, uh, or a very recent DVT, and even wearing TED stockings is a little uh, controversial. If they are going to be worn, they should generally be well-fitting, uh, and that generally rules out the TED stockings you can buy at Boots at the airport that most patients will go for. There's no proven role to taking aspirin uh, on flights, although guidelines vary. The new guidelines out of the States, which are very influential, say no, uh, but the Scottish Intercollegiate Network, the SIGN guidelines, say yes. Um, but on the whole, um, other than walking up and down, not getting dehydrated and doing leg exercises, most patients uh, don't need anything when they go on a long-haul flight. Uh, and uh, kind of finally, uh, just said that the thing with thrombophilia testing is the really important thing is the history of having had a, a VTE rather than any defect. Um, if you've had a, DV, uh, a DVT, for example, then uh, the most recent guidelines would recommend, even if that DVT is uh, a first DVT, if it's unprovoked, the patient, if they're fit enough, should be considered for lifelong anticoagulation even after only one event, whereas more traditionally that's done after a second unprovoked event. Um, because warfarin uh, won't reduce the risk of recurrence. There's about a 30% risk of recurrence if you've had a DVT or a PE that's unprovoked. 
And being on warfarin for six months or a year or two years simply delays when that recurrence occurs, but doesn't really reduce the risk of recurrence. And over a 10-year period, you're slightly better off being on warfarin and accepting the small bleeding risk uh, than you are stopping the warfarin and accepting the 30% risk of a, a further VTE. Uh, and thrombophilia tests are limited. We can only test for a certain limited repertoire of known abnormalities, and there are almost certainly abnormalities out there that we don't know about that, that go untested for. And having a negative thrombophilia screen can give a false sense uh, of uh, security. Uh, and finally, it, it almost never makes a difference to what we do. In fact, the uh, British Journal of Hematology recently published a review uh, of thrombophilia testing and essentially said, uh, don't bother, except in very limited circumstances, such as somebody with a strong family history who's about to embark on a, uh, an at-risk venture like being pregnant or, or starting the pill. Um, and the British Committee for Standards in Hematology uh, advise that thrombophilic, thrombophilic screens should certainly be interpreted by an appropriate specialist, which is almost always uh, a haematologist. So the, the final slide here, the thrombophilia screen uh, that Jason and Jackie, uh, sorry, the thrombophilia clinic that Jason and Jackie are setting up, uh, the aim is really to harmonize the advice and counseling that patients get, uh, to reduce unnecessary um, investigations, uh, and to have uh, all requests vetted by haematologists as a way of doing that. Um, and uh, they'll discuss uh, requests that, that may be inappropriate with the, the requester uh, and offer ad further advice. Uh, and of course in the de dedicated clinic we can offer um, appropriate counselling to patients, uh, not just testing, but we can talk about uh, you know, the risk to other members of the family, the risk uh, if they get pregnant or go on the pill or start HRT, having had a VTE regardless of any thrombophilic uh, testing. And we hope that service will be very valuable. Um, and will be uh, widely uh, used and, and we think GPs will, will be a major user of, uh, of that service. That's uh, pretty much the end of the presentation. Um, and now Ray tells me uh, that uh, I'm slightly ahead of what you actually see. So we'll give it a few minutes uh, and then if you want to ask any questions just type them in uh, and send them in to us and uh, we've already got one question I'll tackle in a minute. Um, but uh, we'll just wait a few moments, see if we get any more questions, and then we can discuss those, or indeed comments or, or suggestions about the network service, or uh, indeed what you might like to see in any future webcasts that uh, that we do. Um, so we just have a, a break for a moment or two. I think we might we could turn the sound off a minute, and um, in fact, um, Jason could always jump in with typed answers in the chat room, but then you might yep. sort of sum up the the whole thing. Maybe so. Maybe we'll yeah. Okay. We'll just, so we'll, we'll, we'll just turn this. You'll, uh, well, we can leave the sound on if we don't. If as long as we remember, it's on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just leave it for a minute. Yeah. Ah. We've got um, in total. We've got uh, seven real people, <laughs> so, and and three three or four people who are just imaginary. Well, or? Jason, uh, Cito, myself, and Graham, uh, who are here for the um, Julian Cox, I believe, is from the uh, deanery. I think is that right? I think uh. I rec recognise the name. Caroline Flynn, Simon Jones. It'd be good if. Oh, Simon Jones, excellent. Hi, thank you, Simon, for um, sending around uh, a lot of the uh, publicity for uh, this. Uh, a little unfortunate we've scheduled it for half term uh, when obviously uh, uh, people are, uh, are away, but it's a, a trial run uh, just to see if uh, this would work and uh, if there would be any interest in it. It would be good if people actually made the sort of comment about the actual process as well, if they've got, even if they've not got any questions about the haematology or the clinic. Yeah, no, feel, feel free to make any comments uh, uh, that you like.
Okay, so um, <clears throat> we've got a, a, a couple of uh, questions. I'll, I'll read, to, um, we've got one about uh, from affiliate testing. I'll read that one out uh, first uh, because Jason is uh, lurking in the background and may well have an opinion on this. So how would you advise a woman who says her mother had a DVT but is no longer alive so cannot be tested? Uh, should she have a thrombophilia screen before starting the OCP? I mean, it would be useful, I guess, to have some more detail about the uh, circumstances of her mother's DVT, if that information is available. Uh, was it provoked, uh, for example? Uh, how certain was the diagnosis? Did her mother have um, ultrasound, or was uh, the diagnosis based purely clinically? Which um, you know, if her mother's no longer alive and died of old age, the diagnosis might have been made some years ago when uh, perhaps testing was less robust. Uh, uh, but I, I think uh, Jason might want to uh, to speak to whether she should have a, a thrombophilia screen or not. Uh, my own feeling is it, it wouldn't be entirely unreasonable, um, but, uh, uh, but we'll wait for words of wisdom from the master. In the meantime, uh, one of the other queries was, uh, can you explain how plasma viscosity varies in PMR, which I, I assume to be polymyalgia rheumatica, um, because uh, the ASR has, has uh, long been used, and uh, the PV in, in some cases uh, more recent uh, addition to the, the repertoire. I mean, I think as a, a general rule, the, the plasma viscosity in the ESR will uh, co-vary uh, and in the... Uh, uh, the same direction, so that they'll both go up and down together, and they'll go up and down more or less in the same conditions. Uh, the slight difference is that the ESR is affected by uh, things which affect red cells, so uh, polycythemia, uh, for example, uh, will reduce the uh, ESR, anemia will cause the ESR to rise, um, spherocytosis, which one can get in autoimmune hemolysis, uh, sickle cell and some other abnormalities of hemoglobin which cause red cell shape change uh, will also lead to a decrease in the ESR. Um, but I think in someone with polymyalgia rheumatica uh, they may well develop the anemia of chronic disease if they have uh, poorly controlled disease and that anemia may then cause the ESR to be falsely elevated and the plasma viscosity is spared um, from any kind of interference in that score. Uh, so it's possibly a slightly be better uh, measure of inflammation. And the other thing is the plasma viscosity really is not as affected by age um, as the uh, ESR is. Uh, there's only one study I'm aware of which compares the two tests directly in polymyalgia. Um, and that was done uh, almost 30 years ago in the late 70s. And it concluded uh, that the ESR and the PV were essentially equal in monitoring the disease, uh, were equally sensitive uh, to uh, changes in disease state. Uh, but it is occasionally possible to get patients whose ESR is up but the plasma viscosity is not, uh, who have apparently active disease, and vice versa, though uh, perhaps slightly less likely. So I think the PV, use it as you would have used the ESR, basically, I think for pretty much everything. There's another question from Miranda there. Do you want to oh, see that? Um, or a comment? Uh, a comment? Uh, but uh, yes, I think that's, that's something that we could probably do better, and that is uh, the weird and wonderful drugs like thalidomide, like lenalidomide, the son of thalidomide, um, and uh, some of the uh, less common things that we do, or indeed the less common um, combinations uh, that we use. Uh, I think, uh, sorry, it's been reminded to look at the camera there, uh, would, it would be helpful for us to give more information out. And I think one thing we might explore with our nurses, especially when we get an additional nurse in post at uh, the North Devon Hospital, is providing some kind of information summary uh, for GPs. Uh, at the moment we give patients a printout of uh, cancer backup information on each of the drugs that they receive. And that information is available on the website and it's very good. And we just print it straight off for patients because it's better than anything we might concoct ourselves. Um, if it would be helpful, we're very happy to include a copy of that with the standard clinic letter. So when we start a patient on, you know, uh, bortezomib, uh, Velcade, uh, for example, we could include with the, the letter uh, just a print off of the relevant side effects um, and other important things that need to know, drug interactions uh, and, and so on. Um, also, and to get that up and running smoothly, um, there is a very excellent website 
uh, from the British Columbia British Columbia Cancer Agency in Canada. Uh, it's um, you have to go, if you go to Google and you type in BC Bravo Charlie uh, Agency Chemotherapy. Um, I think you'll find it very near the top of the list, and they have a, a health professionals index of all chemotherapy drugs, which is absolutely superb. You get a PDF that details all the side effects, all the drug interactions, everything you could possibly want to know about these drugs, but it's quite readable. Um, but I think, yes, it is incumbent on us, I think, to ensure that our colleagues in general practice are adequately informed about drugs that, you know, by the very nature of our differences, you are not going to be so familiar with. Um, and I think that's an area we, we will try and work on. Jason has made a comment there, if you want to. Uh, read it. Jason, uh, yeah, depending on the circumstances of DVT, um, if in doubt, a thrombophilia screen may be appropriate. So uh, I think we're, we're broadly in a, uh, agreement there. Um, uh, I don't know if, uh, if there are no more questions coming through so far. So uh, if Jason uh, has anything to suggest or that uh, we might want to uh, comment for it, just alternate the word restriction on this. It's Miranda saying that would be brilliant for us. We could get in the patient's records. Yes, no, I appreciate you guys. Our are, are, are ten-minute consult is hard to, uh, as you say, Google all the stuff. Um, I'll take that on board and uh, bring that up at our next department meeting and see if we might be willing to adopt that as a departmental uh, policy. And it's very easy for us. We just, on the clinic dictation, just say to the secretary, please include a printout of whatever. Uh, and in fact, when we're seeing the patients and consenting them they get a copy of all of this, so it would be very easy to print out another copy um, just to be sent off to you guys. Jean Brown is, uh, is saying it's an excellent way of communicating, but many GPs are still working at 7 o'clock. So, when, uh, when, when's a good time? Yeah, when's a, when's a good time? Um, not entirely sure I, <laughs> I want to be doing this at midnight, but uh, we, can be, uh, we can be flexible. I mean, uh, potentially, uh, well, maybe not a lunchtime slot, because we're down here in Plymouth, um, to use the equipment that Ray has very kindly allowed us uh, to use, so it's probably not practical during the day. Um, although <laughs> unless we, you can get your own equipment, unless we can get our own equipment, yeah. uh, which is yeah. something. If this was popular, it's certainly something that we would consider doing. Um, we have got a small broom cupboard that we could use uh, for this kind of thing. Um, and if it was popular, then then I think we would certainly uh, look at getting some funding for that. But in the meantime, uh, it's a trek down to Plymouth, uh, and so the evenings. Uh, would work best initially, but we can do it a little later in the evenings if that's a time that would suit people. The other thing that would be handy to know would be if there's a particular day uh, that is more suitable uh, than others for the majority of, of GPs. Uh, Otherwise, we've sort of come to a yeah. I think come uh, to an end for the minute. I think we've come to the end of our, our inaugural webcast for the NDDH RDE Hematology Network. Uh, if anybody has any suggestions for a nice uh, acronym or uh, uh, title for the network, they would also be very welcome. Um, we, we'll make, we can make the recording available um, somewhere on the web, if you, wherever, we, wherever you want it. So, uh, yeah, it's... Probably it's, on, our, on our archive, if, uh, if yeah, anywhere else. Yeah, it, it'll be on the archive um, here. Uh, it should be fairly easy to find. So, by all means, tell your colleagues uh, that you came and listened uh, to the webcast, and it was interesting, hopefully, uh, and direct them to find it, because we'll, we'll keep a check of how many people actually come to the look at the archived uh, cast uh, and get some measure of how uh, much value there would be in doing another uh, webcast. And I think a future webcast would potentially be um, largely a kind of question and answer session, looking at interesting referrals that we've done and then taking questions from you guys. Uh, that everyone can listen into, unless there are particular things that people would like us to uh, uh, address in a, a future webcast, and we'd be very happy to look at that. Um, shall we? Uh, uh, Miranda, she's been asking whether the PMS had something along the same lines. As far as I know, the answer is no. Uh, not to my knowledge. Yeah. Uh, but we could help them set something up if they want to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay. If not, I think we're, uh, yeah, we're finishing. I think we'll call it. Thank you very much for taking the time uh, to listen in uh, and to interact with us. And hopefully uh, we'll see you in a future webcast. Thanks again. Bye.